my lovely, lovely imps. Today, we are going to talk about something that is near and dear to my heart. And that is the topic of environmentalism. Now, I've told this story before, but a lot of you probably have never heard this. Uh, my actual first introduction to any sort of lefty progressive thought was environmentalism. Um, I grew up in a extremely right-wing Christian environment. I was raised in a cult. Um, I have a whole video about it. I talk about it pretty frequently on this channel, but uh, it was a very, very uh, strenuous and scary and terrible experience all in all. But uh, my first like real introduction to leaving the sphere of, of sort of mainline conservative thought um, was environmentalism and also feminism to a certain degree, but that's a story for a different day and it's a, and that's a little bit a little bit weirder. And I can explain it like this. Um, growing up super Christian, um, you will find yourself in an environment of people who at least, at least in fundamental evangelical Christianity, um, they don't have a lot of respect for the environment. Fundamental evangelical Christianity, fundamentalist evangelical Christianity has a lot of overlaps with, uh, you know, fireworks and guns and trucks and, and, and support your businesses and never, you know, you don't want to be a commie, do you? Um, there's a huge overlap between hyper capitalism consumerism and uh, fundamental fundamentalist evangelical Christianity, which might seem weird to you, um, but I assure you, that's true. They're like they love that shit, okay? And it's really weird because um, that's not really how the Bible is. Like as a book, the Bible itself is not really uh, all about the money and the big cars and the performative masculinity. It really isn't. Um, but it's a big part of fundamentalist American Christianity. And so when I started to leave the cult that I grew up in, um, one of the things that I first noticed, this was before, this was like before I became like, uh, uh, critical of Christianity as a whole and was more just critical of the branch of Christianity that my uh, family was uh, was like a part of. I realized that there was a lot of hypocrisy about the environment. Now, in, uh, in, in the Bible, there is a really, really pivotal verse. Uh, it's in Genesis. And uh, the, the, the basic, I'm not going to read it out to you one for one, but, I, but the basic gist of it is that God is speaking uh, uh, to Noah and he commands Noah to be a steward of the earth and to have dominion over it. And it's really interesting because some Christians really fixate on the stewardship part and a lot of Christians, specifically the American evangelical type really fixate on the dominion part. Now, stewardship is a word that basically means that you are, it is a steward is somebody who is caring for something that belongs to somebody else. A steward is like somebody who you leave, uh, 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 in the, like, like if you're, if you're, uh, you're traveling and you need somebody to watch over your house while you're gone, you could appoint a steward to watch over your house. Um, stewardship is it is it is a a job that implies guardianship. You are protecting something that is not yours that trust is being put into you. Of course, we all know what dominion means. You know, we all know what that means. So it's interesting to me because when I first started leaving the Christian uh, uh, the Christian cult and uh, became critical of that environment. Uh, this was one of the things that I found myself grappling with was that they that they always fixated on this idea of having dominion over the earth, where the actual Bible says both you are you are called to be a steward and you are given dominion over the earth. But they but the Bible says the stewardship part first. Which is which was interesting to me. 
So when I went to college and I encountered environmentalism, I went, hey, wait a second. Why are Christians, why are so many Christians against environmentalism? Why are so many conservatives against environmentalism? It says right here that God calls us to be caretakers of the planet Earth. And there you have it. Like I said, environmentalism became one of my first uh, ways of, of connecting with a politics beyond what I had been taught. I think environmentalism is really important. And not just because of my uh, my personal uh, how how much it affected me in in challenging the way that I had thought about the Christian worldview. I think environmentalism is uh, a is is a a a school of thought that encourages people to pay attention to the world that they exist in. That that calls people to look beyond themselves in a way that we are actively discouraged from doing in American culture. In American culture, uh, people are fixated on uh, on possessions, things that you can own, things that you can lord over other people. Um, you are there is a a incredible. Uh, 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 people call it bootstrapping. You know, the idea that you got to lift yourself up by your bootstraps. That is a, it, 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 it creates a very insular and inward looking culture where people are obsessed with their own achievements, where people are obsessed with their, uh, their own goals and their own things. It's a very um, self-centered worldview. And I think environmentalism challenges that. But more so than all of that, we need an environment to live in. So does every other living being on this planet. Humans cannot exist on sterile tiles. We cannot exist in a world of concrete. We simply cannot live. We can't live in a world made purely out of tarmac. It's actually not possible. We are, our physical organic bodies need an organic environment to thrive in. We need water, we need air, we need uh, you know, vegetation. And more than that, we need other living things around us um, in so many ways. And I think that environmentalism has, um, has somewhat fallen by the wayside um, in, in recent memory, in a lot of um, left-leaning spaces, in lieu of this sort of uh, very... How do I describe this? It's hard to describe. It's like a, um, maybe you guys know what I'm talking about. Maybe my chat will understand what I'm talking about here and maybe my viewers will. Um, people talk about urbanism a lot. Like a lot, a lot, a lot. Like right now, that's like a trend in like lefty progressive spaces to talk about urbanism, talk about urban design, to talk about better city design. And this is no hate on those things because I completely understand where people are coming from. Um, like... A lot of people live in really big cities and American cities are completely overrun with roads and whatever. However, most of the world is not a city. Um, most of the world will never be a city um, unless like maybe in some very distant future, the entire planet has been hollowed out and turned into some kind of like mega city, which honestly sounds like a dystopia. Um, and so I think that while there has been a, there, while it is completely understandable and I actually like, like a lot of the things that people have to say, um, in these sort of like urbanism focused, uh, conversations, uh, I think a lot of, um, a lot of it comes from, uh, a, a, a deep level of doomerism and it makes me sad. Um, I think a lot of people basically gave up on environmentalism. I'm talking about older people here, younger folks, you guys, hey, that's why I'm that's why I'm talking out there. I'm hoping that we can change minds. But I think a lot of people gave up on environmentalism because uh uh because there was a perception that uh there's no chance of anything changing, that the road world is the only future that we will ever have. Um, and I think a lot of this comes from sort of uh, the underpinning assumptions of American life that, um, uh, you know, 
as Americans, uh, the idea that anything will ever affect the consumer position, that people will someday perhaps buy less products, that perhaps people will own less cars, uh, or or whatever, um, is is like that's that like that that flies counter um, to uh, that flies counter to the mentality of a lot of Americans. The idea that any of these things could happen, that's like forbidden because then you're just saying, oh, what are you? Like what, you think that we shouldn't have iPhone? What, you think we shouldn't have computer? You wanna live in a cave and clap two rocks together? And of course the answer is no, nobody wants to live in a cave. Well, maybe somebody does and clap two rocks together. But, uh, uh, but this type of uh, assumption, the idea that you can never talk about a world that isn't firmly uh, and eternally urban um, is, I think it's bad. I think it's, I think it, it leads us to, uh, to, it doesn't actually deeply challenge a lot of the things that I mentioned before. Um, and, uh, I really want to encourage people to think more about environmentalism, to think more about the natural world, to think more about the beauties of the world beyond the urban. Um, because, uh, there's a lot of reasons. One, it's beautiful. Guys, life, the unfathomable diversity of life that exists even in a single forest or in a single river is be beautiful to a degree that is almost impossible to capture in words. In fact, it is impossible to capture in words. It can only be experienced. A picture, a video, a, a, a summary is, um, <laughs> is, is, not, it doesn't do even, it doesn't even come close to the experience of existing in a place that is teeming with life. Most of you have experienced this at some point or another in your life. You have stepped into a place like a forest, uh, or, or, uh, you've gone swimming at a remote lake and you have been astounded by the amount of, of, of vibrance around you, the just sheer unfathomable bound of life where you look in any direction and there are so many different species of plant in that direction that you wouldn't even be able to name them even if you were an expert even if you spent your entire life studying all the plants in every book if you just looking at a patch of forest you would never be able to categorize all that is there and um that in and of itself is something beautiful that should be encouraged, protected, and preserved. And I think that this gets lost um, with the current sort of flavor of the moment uh, fixation on urbanism. And again, I want to reiterate, that's not me thinking that like, uh, you know, people who are talking about making bike friendly cities and public transportation and all of that and criticizing cars and whatever stuff that I myself have done. I don't think those people are bad. I just think that perhaps there has been a too, little too much of a, of a tight focus on that and forgotten the broader question of why and uh, what else is important beyond the city. Um, a lot of people don't live in cities. A lot of people will never be able to live in a city. Um, no matter how much of a, you know, utopian urbanist you are, there are always going to be people who, for one reason or another, live in a remote area. And if those remote areas are destroyed because of environmental damage, because of pollution, because of whatever, not only will it make life in cities impossible, because of course, all cities, Every single city in the world relies on rural areas for almost all of its resources. That's just a simple truth. Cities do not have the space to produce large amounts of food. They rely on other areas to produce food. They rely on other areas to, you know, be able to create, you know, large amounts of plants, whatever. These things are connected to one another. And I think it's really important that people re rediscover a holistic environmentalist view which can include uh, uh, critiquing uh, the structure of cities, which can include the reliance on, uh, you know, critiquing reliance on cars. Um, 
I really want to uh, encourage people to uh, embrace a full view of environmentalism. And to this point, I want to share an experience with you all that happened very recently. Um, the other day, I live in a big city. I live in Seattle. I grew up in one of the most rural areas of America. Um, seriously, like an extremely rural area, okay? Um, and, uh, uh, and but I, I now live in a very large city. And uh, I've lived here for a quite a large number of years. And one thing that I have never truly and fully gotten used to is sound pollution. And some people who grew up and spent their whole lives in cities, they are a little bit more mentally adjusted to sound pollution. However, um, studies, there has been an, a, a large amount of studies um, that have been done showing that noise pollution contributes to heart disease, high levels of stress and anxiety, depression, um, and early death. Because over time, even if you sort of train yourself to tune it out, your body is actually under, excuse me, my goodness, um, is actually under a lot of uh, uh, pressure and stress. I live in a big city. The other day, I woke up and it was like 9.30 probably in the morning. And I took my dog out for a walk. And... I was coming around a corner on a road and all of a sudden I I was like stunned for a moment. And the reason why I was stunned, it, it, it actually like it was I was busy. I was thinking about other things. I was, you know, you know, walking my dog actively. Uh, and then all of a sudden just something came to my mind. And it was the fact that for the first time in so long, I couldn't hear a plane. I couldn't hear a boat. I couldn't hear a lawnmower. I couldn't hear a power tool. And the only like human sound that remained at that moment from the city was a very distant roar of cars on the highway far away. And in that moment, I could hear like eight different bird songs. I could hear the wind rustling in the leaves and in the plants around me, all around me. And I was actually like overcome with emotion in that moment because it was so stark that it like became a moment in my mind that I was like, oh my God, wait a second. The plane noises, the boat noises, the lawnmowers, the power tools are all quiet for just a moment. And it was like a, a chance occurrence that was shocking. Okay? And I'm hardly the only person who has experiences like this, who is aware of the sheer amount of noise. Uh, like I said, this has been studied to a pretty extensive degree. But that moment was very stark for me. And um, it inspired me to want to talk about environmentalism explicitly because um, you can't fix the problem of noise and light pollution just with smart urban planning. You can't fix the problems of noise and light pollution, uh, of, of yeah, noise and light pollution uh, uh, just with, you know, uh, dense housing. Um, and in fact, uh, some of these problems go far, far, far beyond the issues that we have in our cities. Um, the fact that, can you hear that? Hear that plane right now? You might be able to hear it over my microphone. There's a loud prop plane right outside. All day, every day, literally millions of people are bombarded with these little prop planes. Some of them are tourist planes. Some of them are people just wanting to be able to fly out to their own place. Some of them, I'm sure, are, are on some sort of very important business that could not be done. But a lot of it is just excess. It is just, I have the money to have a plane and I want to fly, so I'm going to do it. 
even if it 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 coughs a fuckload of poisonous gas into the air, even if it bombards literally tens of thousands of people with an incredibly loud noise that they can't do anything about. Um, you can't address that problem with just thinking about urban planning. That is a bigger problem that, that talks about what the hell are we doing with our environment? What the hell are we doing with the spaces that we live in? And I want you to go, I want to just take one minute to just sort of take your, uh, your empathy and direct it in a different direction. I've been talking about people a lot. I've been talking about myself a lot. But I want you to think about what it does to animals, which I think a lot of us really like animals. And in fact, we rely on animals in ways that we don't even understand to the full degree. Uh, ecosystems are hugely interdependent. Uh, bugs, birds, fish, all of these coexist together in ways that are so complex that sometimes uh, we still, to this day, get blindsided by ecosystem collapses that ruin environments for us down the line. But those animals all are living beings, okay? And not just that, they are a part of living ecosystems, which are incredibly important to live on a planet that's actually like worth living on, okay? And, you know, I try to not like make spiritual invocations or, you know, to, to, to wax too poetic about this stuff. But you know that like a lot of environments have been completely and utterly destroyed and that even remote environments that are otherwise vibrant get regularly disturbed by the way that we live our lives, which requires us to start thinking about the environment. There are amazing and beautiful creatures that are incredible to be able to share the world with that are suffering because of decisions that we make as a society that is incredibly turned inward and is incredibly consumeristic. Um, I like to think about, you know, you wanna know one that's crazy? Bald eagles. Bald eagles are the symbolic bird of America. And I don't know if you guys know this, but bald eagles are incredibly uh, sensitive creatures. They're amazing. If you've ever seen a bald eagle flying or swooping down to catch a fish or, or, or preening its feathers, it is a, it is a profound experience. I, that's the only way I can describe it. Uh, even for people who aren't, I mean, I'm really, I love birds. Okay. I, I talk about birds on my show all the time, but even for people who aren't like super into birds, if you get to see a bald eagle, it will take your breath away. They are an impressive, impressive creature, but they're very, very sensitive when it comes to breeding, noise, temperature, and pollutants have <laughs> over the years made bald eagles endangered. And a lot of their environments are ones that people like to disturb to a great degree. Bald eagles, a lot of people don't know this, bald eagles mostly eat fish. Did you know that? That's their primary food thing. They like big lakes and they like to live in trees, tall trees near big lakes. But guess what? You wanna know what doesn't mix well uh, with tall trees and big lakes? Well, people's houses, you see, you have to get rid of tall trees in order for people to have nice, expensive waterfront properties. And guess what? You can't have a quiet lakeside if that person with that nice, expensive waterfront property also wants to have a, a noisy motorboat so they can go ride around every single day and, uh, uh, you know, uh, for whatever reason they desire because they want to have, you know, dominion over the water, so to say. Um, I, I live in a very dense... Uh, uh, you know, like I said, I live in Seattle. I live in a very dense urban area and the lakes around here are, uh, completely inhospitable to anything but rich people. I mean that, um, the lakes have been, the lake shores have been turned with very few exceptions where environmental law often that was fought for by environmentalists prohibit uh, or have set out public parks or have set out, uh, uh, you know, 
state or city parks specifically, they are lined with cookie cutter McMansions. Bam, 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 bam. Every single one of them with a boat that runs on petroleum that's dumping pollutants into the lake that makes a fuckload of noise and disturbs all of the animals. Bam, the whole edge of every lake in the area. And this is just one off-the-cuff example. It's wild. And it's not like these are houses that are, you know, housing a lot of people. This is usually a single-family residence, usually for an older rich person. And that's not me saying that I'm completely against lakefront property, because I do think that it's an amazing experience to be able to live on a lake. In fact, I come from a state where a lot of people do live on lakes, but in the state that I'm in, the lakes aren't that crowded. There are uh, common sense uh, and also explicitly designed protections to make sure that lakes don't just become a stack of McMansions for personal use. Uh, there are, you know, stringent uh, environmental laws that protect the life in those lakes so that those lakes can still be enjoyable and healthy places for people to live. We, in our society that is so consumeristic, have completely forgotten the need for an environment. Also, have you guys noticed that I haven't mentioned climate change basically at all this entire conversation? Climate change is a big conversation, and I think it's a really important topic to talk about. However, the reason why I haven't talked about climate change this entire time is because I think that sometimes climate change can function as a thought terminating buzzword, that people see it as an event of the apocalypse that can be invoked to cause fear, as opposed to something that should make us think about what could prevent climate change and why climate change even matters in the first place. Climate change threatens to destroy the natural environment that we rely on, that so many of us in America right now have forgotten that we need to survive. I really want to encourage people to rethink uh, uh, taking, taking strength and passion from the concept of environmentalism, from a position that constantly encourages protecting the natural environment to the best ability possible. Um, because uh, I think our society is so far in the opposite direction. It's so far gone to the degree that, um, that uh, people are willing to flatten wetlands um, for whatever, for, for anything, for a fucking shoe store, for fucking anything that could be built anywhere. There are so many examples of this that I could talk about, but I actually want to share something with you guys. Um, and this is a this is a video that we're gonna watch that's that's designed to 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 give you guys an insight into what I'm talking about, to how bad the problem actually is, and just how important it is that people start thinking beyond just small scale things beyond just cars, but thinking about the environment as a whole, as something valuable in and of itself that should be preserved and protected. So real quick, I want to share a video with you by a channel that I quite enjoy. Okay. We're going to watch a video by a channel called My Life Outdoors. Um, and this is a video about sound. And I think you guys are going to find this incredibly, incredibly fascinating. So I encourage you to check this out with me. Let me just show you real quick. Let's watch together. Uh, by the way, this is the channel, My Life Outdoors. I want to show you their, their channel just so you guys can go check them out. I think you'll find them valuable. Most of their content is, um, is about uh, camping stuff. It's about how, like, literally the practical nature of camping, about how you can go do stuff outdoors. They're an outdoorsy channel, but occasionally they do videos about, specifically about environmentalism. And this is one of those videos that we're going to watch together. It's called The Wilderness Has a Big Problem. Bam, I'm gonna send you it right now. You guys can go check it out afterwards, but we're gonna react to it together. 
Without any further ado, let's watch. When was the last... Shh. Listen to that. When was the last time you heard nothing? Our world is a constant assault to the ears. For instance, did you know being exposed to sound over 85 decibels for prolonged periods of time can damage your hearing? To give you an idea of how loud that is, your average gas-powered lawnmower is about 85 decibels. A stadium or a concert is about 100 decibels. An emergency siren, 120 decibels, which is enough to damage your hearing immediately. In contrast, the average conversation is about 60 decibels. The hum of your refrigerator, 40 decibels. A quiet library, 30 decibels. 20 decibels is the sound of a ticking watch. Normal breathing is about 10 decibels. And zero decibels is the softest sound that can be heard by the human ear. Now, you may be wondering, okay, but why am I talking about this? Well, it's actually very fundamental to this channel. You see, from the very first day I started this channel, I've been talking about and filming outside. And I've noticed one annoyingly frustrating thing over and over again. Outside isn't nearly as quiet as you might think. There's a highway not too far from here, and. Every once in a while I can hear the cars. I have been deep in the woods and heard the distant drone of cars on the highway. I have stopped filming countless times to let a jet go past. There's an airplane. Here comes an airplane. A lot of airplanes. Airplanes. There was one time deep in the backcountry of Colorado, I stopped to let a jet go by and as soon as it passed, another one started in. And then another and another until I kid you not, 21 jets flew by. 21 jet. That's not even the worst of it. The worst is that we're actually used to the noise. Hell, we even crave it. And all of this has me wondering, does natural quiet still exist in America? Is there anywhere left that has no sound of a distant highway, no planes flying overhead, no sound of Bluetooth speakers on the trails, or ATVs, or anything made by man? Is there a place where the only sound you hear is silence? And can I find it? To find out, I start. You can probably imagine now why I wanted to share this video with you all and how relevant it is to what we just talked about a few moments ago. Because I can tell you, we're two minutes in and we're about to discover some very, very interesting things about America and the state of uh, specifically, interestingly, combustion engine related noise. I started looking for places that are the least likely to have human noise and commit myself to going to see or at least hear them for myself, which led me to the center of Austin, Texas of all places, to the University of Texas at Austin. And you might be thinking, how do you find silence in the middle of a city? Well, only with a multi-million dollar room specifically designed to block out noise. So it's really quiet. Uh, it's not as quiet as many chambers, and we can talk about why. People are saying that my mic is is comparatively quiet to the video. That's probably true, and I apologize if the audio levels are a little bit wonky. I had to make some f changes at the last minute. Let me know if this is a little bit better. Uh, I'm going to try turning down the audio just a little tiny bit. Hi. That's Dr. Wilson. He said I could call him Preston. This room has been specifically engineered to keep the noise of the world outside, and I'm here because... These rooms have been described as the quietest place on Earth. And they're wedge-shaped so that the sound that enters um, basically bounces back and forth into the um, back of the wedge there. And so uh, that, that's where the sound goes. And um, the closest thing that you might find in nature would be basically uh, a very empty area with um, no reflectors anywhere. So you might imagine a lake bed a uh, dry lake bed, or even, you know, on the ocean where there's no, nothing to reflect sound, and all the sound can go straight up. They've also been rumored to be so quiet that they'll drive you insane. Now, I don't know about that, but either way, I thought I should experience it for myself. Yeah, so, I mean, obviously people have said, you know, that you spend too much time on one of these things and stuff like that, that it, it'll drive you crazy. Do you, do you feel like there's any, any yeah, validity no, I, to that? Yeah, what what, what, I've heard that as well. Um, yeah. So, not for me. But uh, I have heard other people who claim that it's uncomfortable to be in here. Yeah. And um, I don't think it drives you crazy. Okay. I don't have any evidence of that. But yeah, there's definitely a, a, a feeling that you get just because it's unusual. Our brains aren't used to it. And if you 
kind of be really quiet, you'll start to sense that there's like a pressure uh, in your ears. So. So the anechoic chamber was neat to say the least, but at its heart, it's artificial. It's designed to only mimic what Dr. Wilson described as an open plane, where sound only leaves and is never bounced back. Now, what I want to know is, can I find a place like that in nature? Because last I checked, I didn't have millions of dollars to blow on an artificially quiet room. Plus, nature is healing and amazing and cheaper. The question is, where in the U.S. is least likely to have human noise? Now, I feel fairly confident I can get away from cars and urban noise if I walk far enough into the wild. That I'm not worried about. What I am worried about are airplanes. Is there anywhere left in the U.S. that you can go and not hear the sound of a plane flying overhead? So I did a little bit of research and I found this flight path model that Aaron Coblin created. Well, just take a look at that real quick. Take a look at that and just sort of feast your eyes. These are the flight paths that go across America on a regular basis. And look at these areas in between. And just remember that underneath each of these lines is a enormous cone that the sound of their jet engines project underneath. Certain areas are so covered in them that you can imagine that most days you will never have a break from the sound of a jet. Now, I'm not saying that flight technology is bad whatsoever. I think flight technology is amazing and fascinating. But you have to ask yourself, do we reserve this technology that, damp that, that uh, affects so many living beings with each with each commercial jet that flies overboard millions of people along its path will be affected to varying degrees sometimes minimally sometimes maximally uh animals as we're going to see here in a minute are heavily negatively affected by this stuff do we use that for things that are worthy of that level of constant and persistent bombardment and that's just considering airplanes, okay? Because I, I have, to, have to say, I think that we probably rely on flight technology for just a little bit too much. And in fact, the government subsidizes flights to an extensive degree because it's really good for industrial growth, which is, of course, predominantly for profit, for the profit of people who own corporations. And we already know, I don't need to explain to you here, uh, uh, the income inequality, the wealth inequality, the sheer unbelievable wealth inequality in the United States. But let's just say that the beneficiaries of a flight map that looks like this is not the average Joe Schmo. It's certainly not the animals that all live within this world. Let's continue. This shows every flight over the U.S. in a typical day. And as you can see, there aren't many places that don't have airplanes. Most air traffic in the United States is headed inward. But if you go to the very edge of the country, there's far less air traffic and a better chance for natural silence. The biggest irony of this whole thing is I'm taking an airplane to try to get away from airplanes. I'm on my way to the Boundary Waters Canoe Area Wilderness. It is just a handful of miles from the Canadian border. It is about as close as you can get to not being in the United States without actually leaving the United States. And I chose Boundary Waters not just because it's got a good chance of little air traffic, but it is one of only two places in the United States that has been awarded Quiet Park status by Quiet Parks International. Part of the reason there's only two, it's kind of a, a twofold reason. One is that there's not many places that you can go to meet the criteria that we have set up for a wilderness quiet park. This is Matt Mickelson, Wilderness Director for Quiet Parks International. Which is, uh, in short, you need a dependable 15 minute noise-free interval. Can you hear that airplane? So, so just so we're clear, Quiet Parks International, which is a nonprofit organization that is designed into finding quiet locations in the world, uh, says 
you just all that you need to meet the criteria for a quiet park is a reliable 15 minute interval in which you don't hear cars, jets, or boats, or generators or anything like that. And there were two parks in the United States that fit that. Two. Two parks where you can reliably get 15 minutes without machine noise. I hear it, but I don't see it. And when I tell people it's only 15 minutes, they're like, what? That's nothing. Like, there's tons of places you can go and not hear noise pollution for 15 minutes. Can you hear that? There's another airplane. Um, as someone who is doing the research, I can tell you it's just not true. It's even in our, yeah, even in the biggest wilderness areas that we have, even in places that are so remote when you look at a map, you still have air traffic flying over. You still have distant rumble from resource extraction. You still have all these other noise sources. Um, so that's one thing is that quiet is rare and quiet to the metric that we've developed, that 15 minute noise free interval, along with some other criteria we have set up is incredibly hard to meet. Third airplane in the Boundary Waters. Good morning. I've been laying here, not wanting to get out of my sleeping bag, mainly because of how cold it is, and just been listening, and something interesting just happened. So I've been laying here, birds have been chirping, singing, making all kinds of noises, and then an airplane flew overhead. And the moment the airplane noise started to echo through the area, all the birds stopped singing, and they haven't started back yet. I can't hear the airplane anymore, but it's like the airplane interrupted what they were doing. Like, I don't know what to do about that, because obviously I enjoy air travel. I enjoy being able to go places like the Superior National Forest so that I can enjoy places like this. But at the same time, I realize that it's, it's intrusive of nature. But I wish we just didn't just give up. That we wouldn't say, you know, like, well, that's the way that it is, that it's just going to be noisy. Airplanes are going to fly overhead. I wish we had some places that we could protect, not just from cars and automobiles and pollution and human development and all those things, wild places that we would also protect from sounds intruding from above. So he touched on something pretty important there, right? The fact that this noise pollution is, is observably disrupting the life cycles of countless amounts of animals, animals that are important to maintaining a healthy ecosystem on the planet Earth. And again, I am not advocating that we should abandon all air travel or that every place on the planet needs to be quiet. But don't we think that we should give at least a little bit of thought about it, that we should take these things extremely seriously, especially when we are all very, very aware of the fact that climate change is happening and climate change isn't just caused by one source. It's caused by cascades of, of, of complete and disregard for the environment. Maybe we should think a little harder about, um, about how readily we're willing to, 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 to discard our environment in the name of economic growth, in the name of industrial expansion, in the name of furthering wealth inequality. Maybe we should take it a little more seriously. Let's continue. With Boundary Waters ending up considerably louder than I expected, 
I decided to go to one of my favorite parks that also happens to be the birthplace of Quiet Parks International. The One Square Inch of Silence was an organization started by Gordon Hempton. And Gordon is a nature sound recordist, um, Emmy Award winning. And in his time uh, recording all over the world, one of the places he found that was really, really free from noise pollution was Olympic National Park, specifically the Ho Rainforest. The Ho Rainforest has um, got a lot of things going for it, kind of the main fork of the Ho River. In order to get there, you drive a dead-end road. There's no roads that transect and go across Olympic National Park. Um, the other is that there's not a lot of air traffic in the area. So it had a lot of things going for it, and Gordon thought, okay, well, let's recognize this place. But instead of saying Olympic National Park is, is quiet, uh, the idea was to recognize one square inch of Olympic National Park. The thought being that by protecting that one square inch from noise pollution, you're effectively protecting the whole park. I'm gonna take a small moment here to read a comment. Internet Baby says, I'm too black-pilled about environmentalism, and I just hope to make my life, my life and the lives of those around me as comfortable as possible while I'm here, but I have no hope for humans as a whole. That's what I'm talking about. That's exactly what I was talking about earlier. People have become too black-pilled to even think about environmentalism. But I think that thinking about environmentalism, encouraging others to think about environmentalism, talking about the beauty of the environment, talking about problems that are threatening the environment helps combat black pills. It helps, it helps combat that cascading black pilling feeling. And with the black pill just means that people are laying down and accepting the destruction of the planet as a whole. And I don't think that's a good way to go about it. There is so much that can be done. But most of all, even just getting people to think about it makes people more conscientious of the problem. It makes them more willing to think about, wait, wait, wait a second, do I really need to... Uh, 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 do I really need to bring a generator with me every time I'm going camping? Do I really need, um, you know, uh, uh, do I really need to support the candidate that's, that's, uh, that's, that's arguing that we need to have more and more and more industrial growth? Do I really need, uh, uh, uh to, to, to encourage a culture that buys these huge cars? It gets people thinking about the world as a whole. It gets people remembering that there is incredible beauty out there. Um, and so I try to encourage people not to black pill. Additionally, you can make the world a better place by making it more beautiful by spending more time in the natural beauty of the world. You really, really can. Let's continue. I made a camp and I can already tell that this is not going to be the quietest park that I have visited. Not because of any man-made sound. I haven't heard an airplane all day long. But just because of the Ho River is not even a quarter mile that direction. And I can just hear it raging. But you know what? It also doesn't bother me. It's soothing. It's a natural soothing sound. But I can tell you right now that if I get the decibel meter out, it's just not going to be the quietest part. I have not been to this particular park, Lava Monster. Any single noise intrusion can disqualify a park, which is the case with Olympic National Park. Um, if you are in a wilderness area and a fighter jet buzzes over you, we can't call that a quiet park. Um, so a single noise intrusion can disqualify a park. So I was sitting here packing up camp and I heard what sounded like a boat coming up the river. Now, I don't even think that's possible with the Ho River, but it's exactly what it sounded like. And so I grabbed the camera quickly, tried to turn it on so that you all could hear, and I had the audio turned off on my camera. And so 
I was trying to get you to, to hear that helicopter and I wasn't even recording audio the entire time and I ran out to the river just in case it was a boat coming up the river and it turned out to be a helicopter coming up the valley. And that's something that I haven't gotten anywhere else is helicopters. And so on a beautiful day like today, I'm sure that it's very tempting for helicopter tour companies to come out and fly over the park. Helicopter tours are one of those things. You know, I'm not gonna lie. I'm sure it's super, super cool to go up in a helicopter and be on a tour. I don't know. I've never ridden in a helicopter tour. I don't have that type of money. But one of those things where you got enough money, you want to be able to fly above, well, you can fly all over this forest, bombarding the entire thing and every living being in it with sound for your own personal pleasure. To give people a bird's eye view. I know that's a real problem with the Grand Canyon. The Grand oh yeah, Can the Grand Canyon. Uh, when I visited the Grand Canyon, it was just all helicopter noises constantly. There were so many helicopter tours, it was out of fucking control. It has got way too much air traffic. Helicopters flying above overhead and all that kind of stuff. And I really wish that they would do something to protect the parks from the sound of noise, the sound of aircraft. I'm out of breath from running. Other than the one low-flying helicopter, both Boundary Waters and Olympic seem to meet the requirements for quiet park status. A 15-minute interval of silence was dependable, and despite how it might seem, both parks were remarkably quiet. But I still felt like we could do better, so I decided to try one last location further out than any of the other parks that I've visited. I am on my way to Big Bend National Park one of the most remote, if not the most remote, national parks in the entire continental U.S. To give you an idea how remote this park is, the nearest commercial airport, and for that matter, the nearest hospital is a five-hour drive from the park. It is so far out of the way that if I can't find natural silence here, I'm not sure it can be found. Um, a lot of people kind of write off noise pollution as kind of like a whatever, you know, like these are a bunch of tree huggers who will find anything to complain about. When you're deep in the wilderness and you've hiked days and you're miles and miles away from the nearest road and miles away from the nearest human, that, that sort of experience of planes flying constantly overhead brings you out of that moment and brings you away from connecting with nature and connecting to the quiet. Um, I'm sure you can recall moments where you've been in total natural silence and it is an incredible experience. And just to be there witnessing nature at its most natural is something that changes you. It really does change the way that you move through the world. Um, and I think the more people that experience that, um, the happier we're all going to be. Okay. The sun has gone down behind the mountains. I've gotten up to just move around a little bit and that's gotten the flies away from me. And I notice that when I stand still, it's really quiet out here. Thank you for watching what has become my largest project yet. While I was filming this, my wife and I got to spend a weekend in Seattle, and we spent an afternoon at the Seattle Arboretum. And because this project was on my mind, I couldn't help but notice the sound of air traffic overhead. And at first I started to point it out to my wife, and she stopped me and said, don't ruin this for me the way that you've ruined it for yourself. And so I didn't say anything else, but the entire time we were there, it was non-stop air traffic overhead. Yup, yup. So I tell you that because part of me Literally hopes that now that you're aware of this, that I've ruined wild places for you. Only because if you take notice, then maybe together we can do something to help protect the last quiet places left in America. 
This video was completely unsponsored, but I'm grateful to Quiet Parks for their time and assistance that helped make it possible. If you want to donate to Quiet Parks and help them continue their mission to bring more awareness of this issue as well as protect the last quiet places left in the world, you can donate through the links in the description. Please like, subscribe, and do all those other things. And as always, thanks for watching. You may have heard of one square inch of silence. What I got right here, this is my one square inch of shade. Oh, and it's blown away. <laughs> there you have it. Fantastic video by My Life Outdoors titled The Wilderness Has a Big Problem. I'm going to share it again in chat for people who want to share this video around. Again, a really, really, really compelling, really like the channel generally. Most of what he talks about is like, Practi the practicals of camping, but um, this video uh, really struck me and I've been wanting to share it with my community for a long time. Um, as you can see, uh, noise pollution is something that we've basically been, we've basically been asked to just totally accept and it's downplayed whenever it's brought up, but it not only affects our daily lives, it not only affects our daily mental health, it affects entire environments mostly for the benefit of corporations, mostly for the benefit of enriching a handful of people. Um, and it's terrible and it makes life worse. Guys, life is better when there are less stress stressors passively on you. Um, most people don't actually think about this all that often. Most people don't think about the fact that the, the, the current modern American is constantly saddling uh, a, a ton of burdens every moment of every day. Sound, light, um, chemical pollutions, uh, the amount of, 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 of pollutants that people have to breathe in, the air quality that we have to deal with. These are things that stress you in every moment. They take away your ability to live a full life. They lower your extra room that you can use to, to, to live to your fullest every single day. But on top of that, these problems stack up on a massive level to disrupt the beauty and the health of the world as a whole. And I really want to encourage people. The only thing I really want anyone to take away, the, the most important thing, is I really want to encourage people to think about environmentalism more, to actually think about adopting an approach in life where you angle your thoughts at taking care of your environment more, at protecting animals and plants, at, 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 at protecting the natural world, protecting rivers and water sources to the best of our ability. I would never ask anyone to abandon all of the joys of modern technology, but I think that we can acknowledge that a lot of the way, a lot of the things that we accept as normal in our life, um, the fact that we, uh, we accept total, total, like, I mean, you guys heard me talking about the fireworks, the fact that we just have accepted that, uh, that once a year, every year, we, we are going to poison the air to a degree that it's, it's, it is measurably dangerous to go outside and breathe the air in major cities the day after the 4th of July, the day after New Year's. So two times a year sometimes. The fact that we've just accepted that that's okay, not to mention the amount of poisoning of the local environment, the amount of noise damage that that does to tons and tons of people, people who should have the right to not be uh, uh, affected by that if they desire it. And you don't. We've all just been told that that's, that's what we're supposed to accept on a passive level. So if there's one thing you take away from everything I've said in this protracted se segment, please let it be that we should take environmentum, se environmentalism seriously beyond just a buzzword concern about climate change, which is dreadfully important. But we, we have to think about it beyond just a, a political issue that can be categorized away and and filed off in the corner we have to think about it beyond just like things like urban planning and things like that but rather a general approach to caring for the environment i think not only is it valuable but i think it has broad people a, a broad appeal people love 
nature. People benefit from nature. On an emotional level, it is beautiful and wonderful to be able to enjoy nature in a non-disruptive way or in a minimally disruptive way. Um, and also, people need an environment to live in. The entire, all living beings need an organic environment to live in. So please keep that in mind. Thank you very much for watching. Please go make sure you check out My Life Outdoors, but also make sure you subscribe to Demon Mama. And please tell me your thoughts about all this down below in the comments. I would love to hear what you all have to say, your experiences with environmentalism and your experiences with nature. Thank you very, very much.